Yo, 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 what up everybody? Welcome back to another video, Ari here, and today we're gonna be watching how this guy started a billion dollar streetwear company with a hundred dollars. This is the story of Supreme. If you don't know about the brand Supreme, well, today you're gonna find out about it. This is an incredible story, and this is a video actually by a channel called Hook. They make amazing videos. I watched another video by them in the past, and they did amazing research. It's super engaging, so we're gonna watch it together and learn how Supreme got started. So without further ado, let's watch the video. But before that, make sure that you drop a like on this video and subscribe to the channel for more. The likes actually do help the videos a lot, believe it or not, but let's get into it. Just to give you an analogy of Supreme, Supreme is like that girl, everybody want her, and she might give you her number, give you some play, might give you some She don't call you, you know what I'm saying? Like, she don't pick up the phone, like, you're like, oh, I thought you liked me. And it's like, no, nah, I really wasn't that into you. Supreme is hailed as the coolest streetwear brand in the world. Many know of its sold-out collaborations with some of the world's best brands, including Louis Vuitton, and that its resale value can be as high as 1,200% above the original price. But few know the real story behind why the brand skyrocketed and how it all started at a Duracell factory. I actually didn't know that. I didn't know it started at a Duracell factory. In 1963, James Jebbia was born in the U.S. and raised in England. His father worked in the U.S. Air Force and his mother was a teacher. When he was a child, he worked as an actor and starred in popular British TV shows. As a teenager, he stepped away from the spotlight and worked at a Duracell factory. While working there, he would save all of his money to buy train tickets from Sussex to London. He always had one mission in mind find the latest clothing in elusive shops that many hadn't heard of. The cool, cool shops. The shops that carried the cool stuff that everybody was wearing. No big brands or anything. Later, James traveled much further from his childhood home. When he turned 19, he moved to Staten Island with $100 to his name. After settling in, he found a job as a sales assistant for Parachute, a minimalist clothing store. Back then, it was worn by notable style beacons including Madonna, Michael Jackson, and David Bowie. Oh wow. One of Parachute's owners, Morgan Allard, quickly recognized James's passion for retail and took him under his wing. Still, working for the coveted brand wasn't enough to satisfy James's appetite. Parachute was a bit futuristic. Gary Newman came in and Michael Jackson wore the leather jacket with the big epaulets. It was a great time, but I just wanted to do more. It was then that James decided it was time to venture on his own. With his then-girlfriend, Marianne Fusco, he started making and selling fashionable backpacks at a flea market. Eventually, they got so busy that James had to quit his job at Parachute. Afterwards, he poached their manager, Eddie Cruz, to work for him full-time. I really love that. I think a lot of people look at their jobs in the wrong way. I think if you're planning on starting a side hustle, having a job, especially in a field in which you want to start a business in, is low-key genius. I mean, that's going to be the backbone of your business once you do start it. Cash flow is everything when it comes to starting a business. So I think that's a good example for some of you guys that may have a full-time job and maybe you hate it. You know, treat it like this job is funding your business. I think it may help you enjoy your job more. At least it did for me before I was able to quit and pursue my businesses full-time. With the extra help, James started going back to London regularly. Often, he would stop by the smaller shops like Duffer of St. George and Bond. These shops always had cool and unusual things for young people, something that no one else was offering in New York. Inspired by the realization, James and Mary scraped up enough money to toss their flea market table and open their own shop. To convey the inclusion of diverse trends under one roof, they called their new shop Union. Union featured collections from hard-to-find English brands and later an upstart West Coast brand called Stussy. The skate and surf line was founded by Sean Stussy, one of the founding fathers of streetwear. Wow. One year later, a chance encounter led James to meeting Sean. They quickly became close friends, and not long after, they talked about partnering up to open Stussy's first store. Never in a million years, Sean's business partners warned, were wholesalers, not retailers. Still, James pulled Stussy out of Union and helped Sean open his first store in New York. 
Little did they know, it would lead to launching the coolest streetwear brand in the world. That's super cool. In 1991, James and Sean opened Stussy's first store on Prince Street. It was one of the first retailers to launch in the still gritty up and coming Soho neighborhood. That same year, Stussy grew internationally and annual revenue reached an estimated $45 million. Aside from its basic and timeless designs, $45 million? That's actually insane. In 1991? So that's before internet or anything. That's unbelievable. Controlling sales volume was key to success. He's never supplied his demand, and that's always a healthy attitude to take, a marketing executive once highlighted. Sean's reason was an unusual one for a fashion designer. He had no desire to get bigger. You've got to look 10 or 20 years down the road, and nobody in America does. They just want money now. They want instant gratification, but they burn themselves out. Sean stuck with his business philosophy, and to the extent that no one would have imagined. He sold his shares in Stussy and retired from the fashion industry. Now, what the hell am I going to do? James asked himself. By then, James had been to countless trade shows in hopes of finding the latest clothing as he did as a teenager. The only thing that excited him were the skate decks, t-shirts, and sweats. They were powerful and raw and surprisingly hard to find. Few good skate shops existed in New York back then. With the future of Stussy looming, James's instincts told him it was time for that to change and to venture on his own again. He didn't have a business plan or grand aspirations, but he did have a clear vision of what he wanted to create. An authentic skate shop that hardcore skaters would appreciate, but just as importantly, a shop that people who didn't skate would be intrigued by. While James wasn't a skater, he knew hiring skaters would bring his vision to life. That move led to attracting the New York skate community and later high-profile artists and celebrities. In 1993, James discovered a vacant shop near Stussy on Lafayette Street. While it was on a semi-abandoned block, the rent was cheap, so James took over and started to build his dream skate shop. The design was the complete opposite when compared to the tiny dark shops that skaters were used to. It was well lit with bright white walls and had an open layout so that skaters could enter on their boards. It also had plywood shelving and a glass cabinet to feature its products, making it look more like a high-end fashion boutique. Without much thought, James settled on the name Supreme. As for the logo, he asked a friend for help with the design. It came out looking a bit flat, so James handed him a book on the conceptual artist Barbara Kruger for inspiration. The final design was nearly identical to Barbara's work, a red rectangle with white text. Good artist copy, great artist steal. Great example of that right here. This guy took some design inspo from something unrelated and made it his own for Supreme. That's amazing. Several months later, Supreme officially launched. While it carried other brands, it produced three of its own t-shirts to celebrate, priced at around $18 each. One featuring a 1970s skater, one with Travis Bickle from Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver, and one with the shop's simple logo. To attract customers, James played skate and Muhammad Ali fight videos in the window display. He also blasted hip-hop mixtapes onto the sidewalk. While it likely helped, it was his original idea that brought in a large crowd, hiring skaters to run his shop. His first hire was a skateboarder and artist named Gio Estevez. Gio brought in people he knew and trusted, fellow skaters. Naturally, Supreme became their new hangout spot since skate parks weren't a thing yet. And for some, it became more than that. A lot of us who didn't have apartments who had weird situations, we all knew we could go there, get a meal, have a beer, a smoke, a former employee recalled. <laughs> Since James didn't mind, Supreme quickly attracted the rest of the New York skate community. It was then that he noticed how most skaters had great style. They would wear pieces from classic brands like Carhartt and Champion and mix them with luxury ones like Gucci and Louis Vuitton. 
Rarely did they wear pieces from skate brands. It didn't suit their style since most were low quality and designed for the West Coast, where skaters didn't have to deal with harsh cold winters. Wow. So James decided to make something better and contracted Brents, a manufacturer that uses fabrics from original vintage military and workwear garments. At the time, Brents mainly exported to Japan and Europe and were already producing clothes for a few streetwear brands, including Modern Amusement, Fat Farm, and Milk Crate. The first few items that Brents produced for Supreme were crew neck sweatshirts and pullover hoodies. The sweatshirt's retail price was around $70, and the hoodies were between $85 to $90. The founder of Brents, Stephen Brents, recalls that the detail of construction and delivery dates were non-negotiable. People immediately noticed and appreciated the difference in the quality and the fit of the clothing. Even artists like the Beastie Boys and Eric Clapton started wearing them. Damn. From then on, James continued to design more clothes and accessories, inspired by the street styles in New York, London, and Japan. When products started to sell out, James adopted Japan's drop model of releasing limited products once a week. He never expected that it would lead to riots on the streets and later a billion dollar empire. Only one year after launching, Supreme started to make headlines. Vogue featured Supreme in an article with Chanel and highlighted their cult following and instantly recognizable logos. They also stated that Chanel was more likely to be influenced by Supreme than Supreme by Chanel. That summer, Supreme's clothing was featured in Kids, an independent film about troubled teenagers in New York. While the film garnered controversy, it was hugely influential and created a buzz around the brand. Soon after, Supreme's influence reached far beyond New York. It grew a cult following in Japan, which led to opening four stores in the country in the mid to late 90s. High profile artists like Takashi Murakami, Jeff Koons, and Damien Hirst took notice and started to design skateboards for Supreme. Dude, I wanna More do celebrities this. followed suit and started wearing Supreme, including Tyler the Creator, Kanye West, Drake, Lil Wayne, and Justin Bieber. By then, the demand for Supreme created a huge frenzy and sometimes riots. Lines for their drop would form the day before and wrap around the block. Their Nike Air Foam Posit 1 release, in particular, caused so much commotion that the NYPD cancelled it. And since Supreme makes everything only once, flipping its products became big business. Resellers like Unique Hype Collection would recruit people to wait in lines for a drop. Afterwards, they would wait until the products are sold out before selling them in their shop or online at significant markups. The resale price of rare products can be as high as 1200% above the original cost, allowing some to turn flipping into a full-time job or make 7 figures a year. Many have no choice but to buy from them since Supreme only has 12 stores worldwide, 6 of which are in Japan. To date, Supreme has collaborated with an eclectic mix of the world's best brands including Nike, Air Jordan, Comme de Garçon, North Face, Levi's, and Louis Vuitton. And while the brand is now partly owned by the VF Corp and worth over $2 billion, James continues to maintain its culture and independence. In a rare interview with Vogue, he shared, We're making stuff we're proud of, not doing stuff to stay alive. I don't think enough people take risks, and when you do, people respond, in music, in art, in fashion. This is the story of how a flea market vendor created the coolest streetwear brand in the world. For more inspiring stories about today's most successful brands, wow. don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Wow, so I guess that wraps it up. Honestly, I believe we'll definitely be reacting to some more of these videos. I think this channel is amazing. But with that said, I would love to know what you guys think. I'm feeling extremely inspired now from this video. I mean, obviously I'm a skateboarder, so maybe this hits home a little more for me. But I would love to know your opinion on this. This is a little bit of a different video, but it still pertains to building a business and I mean I think nowadays with Shopify like there's no excuse to not build the business that you want so yeah exciting times to be alive as always make sure that you drop a like and leave me a comment I'd love to know your opinion don't be shy and yeah I'll be seeing y'all in my next video peace